All right, so uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Felipe Borges, this is my co colleague Bilal Imaso, and we are planning to make a presentation about uh, Flatpak for people who are not building Flatpaks. You see, this is a conference where a lot of people are uh, part of the ecosystem, but we also are expecting to onboard new people, so that's why we, we came up with this uh, proposal, to try to cont contemplate as many people as, as we could, I guess. So you want to, to speak about yourself? <laughs> Yeah, I am Bilal. I'm a Red Hat software engineer. I also contribute to various stuff in upstream ground projects on Flatpak, Flathub. That's it, more or less. Yes, Flatpak. Yeah. yeah. So I'm uh, I'm Felipe Borges. Uh, I've been working in Gnome as well with Bilal. In I do Fedora and and Rel as well and. Um, yeah, I think both of us are like app developers, so we wanted to present this from also our perspective as, as people who build apps and try to, to cover like what are the scenarios and what are the, the, the challenges you'd face when you are building a Flatpak app for your existing application. So basically, we're going to elaborate a bit on what's Flatpak and what are the goals of Flatpak and what Flatpak is uh, as of today. I speak a bit about the sandboxing because as, as somebody who wants to package uh, our application, the sandboxing is probably the one obstacle you're going to face at first. Uh, portals, which is the way how you can work with the sandbox. And then some. Uh, we're going to share some experiences about uh, using Flatpak in CI, which is also something that has empowered a lot our developer stori story because uh, it's uh, allow us to interact a lot with designer, developers, documentation people. So it's going to be nice to, to offer this perspective. And uh, lastly, uh, distributing apps. Uh, you heard a, a bunch of talks today about FlatHub. Uh, but yeah, we're going to, to briefly explain how you could uh, get your app distributed to a broader audience thanks to Flatpak and, and, and FlatHub and other uh, Flatpak-based repositories. Yeah, just a nice logo, you can skip this one. <laughs> so uh, here I just made a list of goals uh, for Flatpak. So basically what we wanted uh, as a community when we are looking for a solution to the Linux fragmentation problem, right? I, I guess most of you are already used to the idea that in the past distribution, well, still uh, present, but uh, distributions used to pack every single application. There was a lot of duplication because Debian would do their thing, Ubuntu would do their thing, SUSE, Fedora. And uh, the idea of a universal packaging is something that everybody has ever contemplated, but the problem has always been about the the platform, how we are going to equalize the platform so applications would perform similarly and the experience would be uh, consistent. So the build for every distro has been the like fundamental goal, uh, consistent uh, across environments. Uh, distribution, the whole point of having a distribution has been uh, differentiation, right? Distributions have a purpose. And at the same time, when you develop an application, you have a purpose and uh, distributions were somehow getting in the way from the developer guaranteeing that experience uh, to be identical to, to, to everyone. Uh, building tools, another uh, reference to the, the status quo of uh, distributing apps that if you have tried to package apps in various distributions, you can find that uh, the, the packaging methods can get quite complex, uh, RPMs and DEBs and spec files and things like this. Uh, so I think a, a design motivation that uh, was, was taken in Flatpak was about making things very simple like the, the concept of the Flatpak Manifest and Flatpak Builder was really about trying to not repeat the mistakes of what's been done before. Uh, yeah, distribution's made easy, right? The, the idea of Flatpak being a decentralized way and then uh, allowing everybody to participate, but at the same time not adding fragmentation by, by doing that this way. And yeah, it's stable platforms because uh, distributions have different rhythms. Uh, historically, one of the biggest problems uh, that distributions have is the, the pacing, whether you want to move slow with features or move fast. Uh, people usually want a stable, rock-solid system, and they want uh, the newest things. So how can we try to conciliate these two conflicting demands? So with Flatpaks and the concepts we're going to be speaking in the future with uh, runtimes and SDKs, uh, we are like offering a very good uh, way to tackle this problem. Yeah, control over dependencies. Uh, this is something I, I could share as like a personal experience uh, as uh, somebody who packaged an application that has a bunch of dependencies. I work with GNOME Boxes, this virtualization management tool, and uh, it, it requires the virtualization stack. We actually bundle the whole virtualization stack on the Flatpak. And one of the biggest issues I have 
historically had that actually was slowing down the development of boxes was the, the differentiation between distros. Uh, I have had bug reports about people having issues with uh, one package being built with a certain uh, flag that uh, doesn't allow us to consume a uh, feature on, the, on our application and sometimes even trickling down. So one dependency needed a feature to be enabled based on optional dependency and so on. So, and distributions also always, uh, because of the package management way that they are distributing, had uh, this limitation that they want to be able to provide one package that can be used for multiple people. So the use case for server virtualization, desktop virtualization, not necessarily overlapped 100%. So sometimes what they were, uh, deciding what they were like building for was not what I wanted uh, as the platform for my application. So this really brought us uh, control finally to, to developers. So not just in, in terms of the dependencies, but as a whole and the way your application is going to, to, to pres be presented to your users. So even on the, on the question of theming and uh, UI consistencies, uh, you have the power to simply overwrite whatever the distribution would have. And yeah, another goal that uh, Flatpak has has had is uh, being an independent project. So even though a lot of the stakeholders in Flatpak are people who came from GNOME, uh, the idea has always been about reaching out to the broader free desktop community and building something that works for all. Uh, I think uh, uh, Rob mentioned in his uh, Flathub talk that now there is uh, even a, an attempt to make a different uh, organization like from a legal standpoint for FlatHub, so that already indicates that it has been always a motivation not to make something that it's specific to one platform, because the way we work in Linux uh, over the years has been somehow overlapping, and distros are doing the same thing, and we want to look for a solution that is actually going to bring everybody together to, to build something for all. So yeah, uh, so basically the, the things as an app developer that you need to know uh, for Flatpak is the concepts of a runtime and SDK, is something that uh, you have in other platforms. But the runtime is the dependencies that you need for running your application. It's the classic things that you usually would install in a slash user on your system in a classic uh, distribution model. And uh, the, the runtime is like something that uh, I I it's, it's uh, consistent. It's like you want to target a specific runtime because a specific runtime has a certain version of things. And the SDK is what you need when you are building your application. So as a app developer, you're gonna use the runtime and the SDK, but as a consumer, a Flatpak user, you just need uh, the, the, the runtime. Uh, bundle libraries is uh, also another concept. So if your application has some dependencies that are not part of the runtime, because the runtimes, they are designed as such to include the most common dependencies. So once you install a runtime and you have multiple apps that use that runtime, you don't need to actually have those duplicated in your system but uh, apps have their own specific dependencies and uh, you are allowed to bundle those in, in Flatpak, those that are not part of the runtime. And, and you can actually even do runtime overrides by bundling uh, runtime dependencies in case you need something else, but I wouldn't recommend that all the time, just when, it's really when it really makes sense. Uh, repositories, also like Flatpak has like kind of a Git type of design, so the idea that we are speaking a lot here about Flathub as decentralized store, but uh, there are other competing stores and other stores with different purposes. Uh, I think that even this week, uh, Purism has announced that they are like re releasing their own Flathub, Flatpak repository so they can provide their own runtime, their own apps. So I think that that's nice because with uh, the Flatpak client, you can just add multiple uh, repositories and when you do a Flatpak install where you're using a favorite front end like GNOME Software or KD Discovery, you just get the collection of apps from the repositories you have. So you can just collect repositories and then just uh, choose the software from the sources you trust, the software you want. Uh, another concept uh, that explains what Flatpak is about is sandboxing. Flatpak uses a technology called bubble wrap. So this uh, constrains uh, the app because another problem that we are trying to solve with this technology is uh, applications overwriting each other's or interfering with each other's user data or with uh, libraries dependencies. So the, and also the privacy situations, you want to be able to install applications that uh, are just uh, accessing the data that you want them to access. So I think that that also goes well with uh, our open source general idea of transparency, privacy, security. So the sandbox uh, exists and uh, yeah, the sandbox uh, solves that problem, but still introduces some other problem, which is that sometimes you need that data access, you need those system resources access 
So there's when portals enter, and portals are supposed to be some agnostic API that provides this middleman access for the, the application and the system. So either with flat packs or snaps or any other technology that might show up, uh, we can you can use portals to be able to integrate with the system. So if you be interested on, on using resources that are outside of the sandbox, that's the way to go. We are going to be speaking uh, about portals in the end. So yeah, if you are to build a, a flat pack app, I think that this is like the, the pretty much the three steps that you need to look into. Like there, there will be some details about it, but you need to pick a runtime. So your application needs to target a runtime that uh, contains uh, the common uh, dependencies of your application. Uh, the runtimes uh, tend to be able to uh, be inheriting uh, from each other. So the free desktop runtime, it's, I guess, became a standard as the base runtime, and then uh, GNOME and KD have built uh, runtimes on top of it, so they are like subsets of each other. This one that Purism has been working on seems to be on top of the GNOME one, so I think that that's also something nice because we are like also handling the decoupling of uh, dependencies in there. Uh, another decision you need to make about choosing your runtime is the, the live support of the runtime. Uh, the GNOME runtime follows the GNOME versioning schemes, but uh, there are discussions about distributions introducing their own runtime and trying to provide this sale of choose our runtime because it's going to have long-term support. Um, I suppose that uh, if Red Hat would were to, to, to make its runtime available, it's going to be like compatible with the rel support uh, uh, cycle. So I think that that's uh, something you need to consider when you're developing an app. What are your plans for future evolution of your app if you're going to be following uh, runtime updates or if you want to develop something that is rock solid and is going to be enterprise -y. Um Yeah, so the manifest, uh, there the manifest can be written in either JSON or YAML, and basically you describe there what's the runtime and the SDK of your application. You, des you described uh, the sandbox permissions, uh, you and then you just list the dependencies. In the sandbox permissions, we also, I think we're going to show a little bit uh, or details of it, but you can uh, decide what uh, your application is going to have statically by default as, as, as permissions of access. And then build, uh, there's Flatpak Builder as a tool. Uh, we also have some IDEs that do some very good job at building. Uh, Gnome Builder does it very well. So in Gnome Builder, you can just import a, a Flatpak manifest and just press the display button and it just builds the, the Flatpak container and dependency does actually a pretty good job with caching as well. So you might just modify your app and then it just builds from there. But uh, yeah, once you, you build your flat pack, you, you just have this, uh, this app that you can run and you can also produce bundles out of it. So pretty much just three basic steps that you need to address if you want to make your app uh, available as a flat pack as of today. Yeah, so uh, here a bit of detailing on the, the sandboxing. Uh, the goals of sandboxing is really to isolate uh, data. And I, I wouldn't sell this as a security thing. There has been a lot of controversy. They probably have heard about uh, criticisms of uh, Flatpak as a security tool. And it has never been sold as a super secure thing. It's more about you trying to be very clear and transparent about what the app does and what it does not. So uh, app developers can actually enable file system access, can enable device access, and the idea is that we just have a we have explicit way of specifying what are the sandbox holes, what are the the the, the constraints of the sandbox. So uh, either users using the Flatpak client or using software stores or settings applications, they can actually see that information clearly, and and, and that's something transparent to them. Like. In the packaging traditional way, you just don't have that. You install an app and you're like blindly trusting what they are or doing or not doing. And so that's that's something we Flatpak addresses. Yeah, so basically if you just uh, create a basic Flatpak and you just don't poke around, uh, you're gonna have your writable access to this uh, home f uh, hidden folder in your home, slash uh, var app and then the app ID. So this is, uh, in the classic uh, Flatpak app, you would have those files in just in your home folder in dot uh, .config, dot .cache, dot, uh, everything else, <laughs> local. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, the, p the, the writable access that your app has, and everything else is just not uh, available except for, for the runtime. The runtime is mounted as read-only, so your app can 
definitely link against the runtime things and and that's going to work when you're running but you're not going to be able to perform writing access there so you're not going to be actually like altering the runtime so that's that's kind of safe uh yeah display applications are flatpak is targeting at uh, graphic applications ui apps so you're going to have by default uh, display access for x and, and wayland so you, you don't actually need to explicitly uh, bother about that and then some other parts of the file system like the Linux, everything is file, so uh, themes, fonts, and other things that your app is going to need as a graph app using the popular toolkits. So those things are sourced already inside the sandbox, so you don't actually need to, to bother about making fonts available for your app to use. Yeah, and uh, what is not available for default, so before I was describing uh, the things that are av uh, available, accessible by default in the sandbox, and this is what's not. So your home directory, so if you do not set a, per a static permission to, to access the home folder, your default app doesn't, doesn't access it. So if you are writing an app that doesn't need to access user data, there's no point on exposing the user data to the sandbox. I think that's going to be actually a pretty good sale marketing aspect to your app, just saying it doesn't ac access your data. Uh, other parts of the file system, so you are actually don't need to worry about that. Uh, devices, you also, I imagine the critical person who has like problems with surveillance and stuff to like be always wondering, do my apps access my webcam? Or there's some keylogger going on here? So uh, restricting device access by default, it's something, and then you can just poke those, uh, those holes if you actually need it for, for your app. And even better, if you can use portals, right? Uh, portals are going to provide uh, access with uh, permission management, so you can have a permission store, and the user is going to have a UI interacting with that. And uh, the bus system, yeah, w if, if you would have like, uh, access to dbus on your app, you'd be able to just do all kinds of stuff as well, like sandbox escaping, so that's something that sh you, you just don't get by default. There are applications that need it, that they are like more on working on a system level, so for those, you could overwrite this. Yeah, so uh, sandbox holds these overrides that I've been talking this whole time. I, they are kind of a legacy thing as of now, but they are actually the current state of things because we are in a transition. Flatpak has not been designed before the Linux app ecosystem. Flatpak has come after there was a Linux app ecosystem, and now we are uh, transitioning applications. That requires work for app de developers, and that's actually one of the main purpose of us giving this uh, this presentation to actually uh, show you what it is and what you need to mind when you are developing an app. Uh, so. If you want to get your app running out of out of the box very easily, then you would have to poke sandbox holes. But the fu your future goals should be to close those holes and actually use portals. So then you are actually getting into the security model that is is the, the ideal that that we want with permission access, allowing users to grant and and revoke uh, permissions. Uh, home access. A lot of apps, unfortunately, uh, rely on, on on writing and reading from from the home folder. So uh, that's a classic uh, sandbox hole that applications have. Uh, session buzz as well. Applications need to, to rely on information that comes from other system components. So imagine that you have something that needs to get time zone information. So you get that from the system D, uh, from the system D, D buzz interface and, and other things. And also specific access to device. You have a camera device and you need to actually access the, the physical device or you are having a virtualization manage app and you need to actually have access to dev kvm and things like this so uh, this is how the information that uh, flatpak uh, has could be exposed in a graphic interface uh, i think that this is a little outdated but this is how the box page looked like in gnome software back when i did this presentation so those uh, informations from the the, the flatpak manifest can be exposed and then we can have this transparency where the user knows that what the app can and what cannot do. Like you have there are examples of network access, uh, subfolders, uh, user settings. So I, I think that that's definitely a, a progress over what we had uh, before with just simply packaged uh, apps. Yeah, here's another w uh, way of this data being presented. This is in GNOME settings. I also think it's a bit old, sco old school, outdated version, but uh, we also have uh, application uh, 
settings in GNOME where you we also can show what each app does. I know the KDE has it, and I think even KDE has already options to overwrite those settings, so you could go to the KDE settings and even overwrite the, the permissions of the sandbox. In GNOME, as of now, it's very popular for people to use flat seal, but yeah, we just don't really want that to be the way to go. We want everybody to use portals because that's the security model. But yeah, th so this is definitely an improvement over the traditional apps. So you want to talk about So as Felipe mentioned, uh, the main uh, aspect we are missing nowadays in application is the usage of portals. So basically, as applications are sandboxed by default, we, uh, you they can also access the host system resources, such as files or devices, uh, the webcam, or whatever. And the portals are basically made for this. So they are uh, uh, a bunch of APIs that you can talk to in a desktop uh, agnostic way. So we don't have to write a specific code for GNOME, another one for KDE, another one for I don't know, XCFC and so on. So you basically target one API and the portals come with uh, 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 a service that runs on your system and uh, it will detect which portals are available and which implementation exists and we call that implementation. Then gives the application back the, the resources it needs. The existing portals as of nowadays are uh, portals that allow you to access to a specific file, either to read it or save that file for printing, notifications, camera, um, to access the location, set the wallpaper, and so on. And uh, you can interact with these portals either by using DBus directly, or you can use uh, uh, libportal, for example, if you are writing C, Python, or JavaScript, or you can use, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, even if I wrote this library. <laughs> But it's uh, a last library for interacting with portals. And uh, yeah. But there are also various automatic APIs. So basically, if you are using GTK, GTK file chooser native GTK file dialog, you don't have to explicitly interact with a portal. It does that behind the scenes for you and gives you access you don't need uh, to do much. The same thing for uh, print operation for printing, uh, for sending notifications, for inhibiting the application. And the last one is for uh, accessing the user location. So uh, once you have already written your Flatpak manifest, one uh, interesting uh, aspect of Flatpak is that you can build uh, uh, the Flatpak in your CI and you can get a bundle that you can either uh, uh, let the user to test a specific patch or for translators to test how the application is looking and so on. So you can easily uh, do that with uh, GitLab and also GitHub. Uh, for GitLab, we have this uh, already made template that you can include into your uh, uh, CI file, and that will configure almost everything. And you just need to fill specific variables with where the manifest is, what's the application ID, and so on. And it will uh, add a new job that builds the application. Once the application is built, you can also publish it to a specific uh, Flatpak repository, like the Flathub one, for example. Um, for that, we can use Flat Manager, which is also already included in this Flatpak CI template. The same thing that is also possible using GitHub. Uh, we have made this GitHub Actions that are pretty easy to use, that can be made to, uh, as I mentioned, to build your application and publish it already used by very popular applications like OBS because they have some specific uh, restrictions about some uh, uh, keys that are used when building the application to enable certain features. Uh, so they cannot build inside the Flathub repository. So they build in their own CI and then publish to Flathub or Flathub beta. So for distributing your application, you have various choices. You can even self-host your repository if you have some enterprise specific applications that you want not, don't, don't want to distribute to everyone. You can distribute your application on Flathub or use another repository like Elementary, for example. Uh, about Flathub, you could also watch the talk uh, that was done by Bart a couple of hours ago. 
Yeah, an hour, yeah. <laughs> Which explains how Flat, flat Hub works uh, uh, in more details. Uh, so we can skip this part now as it basically uploads a manifest somewhere and there's a builder to build their application then publish it to a Flat Manager. And uh, these are some interesting links. If you want to uh, set up flat pack in your machine or flat hub, and the last one is for uh, accessing the specific, uh, the generic portals API, because as I mentioned, there is the generic implementation and there are GNOME specific implementation on the KDE one, so that when you are running KDE, you get the KDE file chooser, and that's the GTK one. And thank you. Any questions or nothing? I did already ask, I guess, a related question in the previous talk, but I think it's even more related here. So we now allow building uh, Flatpaks in OBS as an open build service in OBS Studio as well. But the major pain is that people that maintain RPMs have hard way to actually create the initial, you know, manifest for Flatpaks. Is there any work that you are aware of for doing something like alien from dev to RPM, from RPM to Flatpak manifest? I think it would be huge help, maybe not so much work, but it would like fill up FlatHub immediately with lots of new applications. Just saying. So I have a wild idea, Not don't take it as, uh, don't quote me on this, but um, uh, one thing that I have proposed when Fedora Flatpaks were being discussed is the idea that you just construct a manifest uh, from the RPM sources and you just write a, a tool to get uh, the patches that you have on your spec file moved into the manifest way. And then you do some uh, linking LD path uh, overwrite to have the builds that are from slash user to slash app, or maybe just run rebuilds everywhere with the, the, the right prefix, because in Flatpak uh, the apps are in slash app. But I think that that's something you could do to rely on your existing spec files, so not on your already pre-built RPMs. So not, not gonna solve your problem because you already have a lot of built ones, but maybe you're not gonna have to rewrite manifests by hand, but you're gonna have your spec files and rebuild manifests from that. So I imagine you just parse a manifest and then recursively go through the dependencies and then you just construct a, the dependency tree on the Flatpak manifest. Just a while that you never tried. Thanks, I have a related question. Uh, would it be possible if you use, for example, Fedora uh, runtime in a, which already exists in Flatpak repository to just during build process install the RPM and I, I understand it would be suboptimal but would it be possible to do something like that because it's the way typically done with docker containers so would it be possible also with Flatpaks? I'm not sure I understand the question actually. Like, like when you, uh, li like in my maybe naive idea uh, Flatpak is just a container, something like, like like a regular container, like a Docker container. Uh, when you are building Docker container, you have a Docker file, and in the Docker file you can do, you install or DNF install some RPM, right? So would something like that be possible with the Flatpak? Uh, I don't know mm, the inside. No, because Flatpak makes use of these specific runtimes. In this case, uh, you don't have access to uh, package management tools. You cannot install things during the build time because usually the build time doesn't have access to network e either. And uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah because uh, the the concept of Flatpak will be building those apps, right? And when you do a DNF install, you're actually getting those binaries, and then those binaries will be built against uh, libraries that were not part of the runtime. So, uh, and then you will just not be able to link against them, or you you would just be shipping binaries I in a content. So you're just defeating the purpose of using Flatpak in the first place, right? You would just be shipping a regular container instead. And you already discussed modularity. Yeah, modularity was kind of like that idea. So so instead of Flatpak, yeah, I would <laughs> probably advise modularity. I just don't know what's the status of that project either. So. Uh, anybody else wants to comment, ask questions? All right, and so thanks for coming. We have uh, lightning talks uh, coming soon, so stay in the room or stay around. Thank you very much. <laughs>